Effective policies developed with the help of accurate and integrated data and statistics can move the region forward. ADB's Key Indicators 2022 helps provide this data to support knowledge sharing among policymakers, development practitioners, government officials, researchers, students, media, and the public. ADB is committed to delivering trusted data to build, support, and strengthen the region's capacity to be more prosperous, inclusive, and sustainable. Good morning, everyone from Manila, and welcome to the 50th Asian Impact Webinar of the Asian Development Bank. Today, we're gonna to hear some key findings of uh, one of the research department's flagship reports, Key Indicators for Asia and the Pacific 2022, which was just released uh, earlier today. Um, this report uh, presents updated uh, statistical indicators on a broad range of development indicators for uh, Asian countries. And in particular, uh, we've been trying to improve our measurement of progress towards the different sustainable development goals. Uh, you're gonna hear from uh, Melissa Pasqua from our statistics group, who will present some of the data and a talk about how socioeconomic deprivations have uh, persisted and even widened uh, during the pandemic. And after that, uh, my colleague Karen Lane will moderate a panel discussion that will focus on one of the uh, issues highlighted by this year's flagship report, which is social mobility. Uh, so uh, in particular, we'll talk about how uh, socioeconomic differences have um, been magnified uh, during the pandemic uh, and how there may have been setbacks in poverty reduction, gender inequality, and uh, educational equity, um, and how uh, policies might be able to improve the lives of the most vulnerable groups uh, in the region and help promote a greater upward social mobility uh, going forward. So uh, let me turn it over to Melissa to walk us through the key messages. Good morning, everyone. And I hope everything everyone is doing fine. And I apologize for that small uh, technical problem. Um, so the report shows how most economies in the region have gradually bounced back in varying degrees from the NACON impact caused by the pandemic. But there are hints of divergent growth paths that some economies have not reverted back to their pre-pandemic growth pace, while others are showing more robust economic performance. As there are several uncertainties which, if left unaddressed, may contribute to widening gaps between the rich and poor, our path should be illuminated by development models that are anchored on resilience, innovation, sustainability, and inclusiveness. Today, we will discuss about social mobility and examine relevant data before, during, and after the COVID-19 pandemic. We will also zoom into how vulnerable populations are faring during this period. Hopefully, this data will set the tone for our panel discussion later, where our distinguished panelists will discuss what governments and the development community in general can do to strengthen social economic resilience of the poorest and most vulnerable amidst uncertainties confronting us. Let me start by asking, what is social mobility and why do we need it? Technically speaking, the concept of social mobility can be defined as the transitions between two socioeconomic status levels over time. It is important to examine the concept of social mobility to gain a more nuanced view of the long-term inequalities between rich and poor. It also provides insights for policymaking. For instance, Temporary increases in the prevalence of poverty due to economic shocks may merit less policy or structural intervention in areas that enjoy high social mobility, where the poor may have good chances of getting out of poverty eventually. On the other hand, increased poverty levels in areas with low social mobility, where poverty may be generational and due to factors beyond a person's control, could be more problematic and require strong policy intervention. Social mobility covers a wide scope and can be viewed from different perspectives. It is important to know which lens is being used as it may yield different results. The pattern depicted in the first figure corroborates with the theory that worsening economic inequality can potentially undermine social mobility by skewing the distribution of resources. <clears throat> 
contributing to the hardening of socioeconomic stratification within educational systems and labor markets. On the other hand, the second panel of the figure illustrates the correlation between enablers in social mobility and extreme poverty reduction based on pre-pandemic experiences of select developing Asian economies. Here, we observe that areas with higher scores in social mobility enablers also experience generally faster pace of extreme poverty reduction. With more equitable distribution of economic opportunities, which are associated with societies enjoying better social mobility enablers, it takes less time for those born in lower social class to reach higher status as their economic prospects are not strongly anchored on their initial socioeconomic status. Now that we have established the importance of having upward social mobility, the next logical question is to ask how our region is faring with respect to social mobility. The first figure provides a simple socioeconomic yardstick to gauge intergenerational absolute social mobility in Asia and the Pacific. Results from World Value Survey suggest that while majority feel their standard of living have improved relative to their parents, a considerable number of Asians feel that it didn't change or even deteriorated. Lower income individuals are less likely to feel that they experience upward intergenerational social mobility. On the other hand, using a different survey-based panel data, we can see from the second chart that a considerable segment of several developing economies' population were unable to break out of poverty before the pandemic. On the other hand, measures of social mobility based on education show that among those whose parents did not have tertiary education, the proportion of respondents from different cohort groups who obtained higher levels of education than their parents, which is a measure of absolute mobility, remains much higher in developed economies, albeit there is increasing trend in some of ADB's developing member economies. Measures of relative educational mobility show stronger intergenerational persistence over time in developing economies. This figure is based on individuals from the World Bank Studies 1980s cohort who were born to parents in the bottom half of the population in education, then assesses what proportion of those individuals have reached the top quartile in education. The result suggests that education mobility among people from lower socioeconomic classes was low in most economies. In fact, only few economies had at least 20% of the 1980s cohort coming from the bottom half in education to reach the top quartile. The pandemic has made it more difficult for poor to climb the socioeconomic ladder, mainly driven by significant job losses and limited access to social safety nets. The impacts of the crisis have weighed most heavily on the poorest and most vulnerable populations across Asia and the Pacific. Longitudinal data collected from two waves of rapid surveys conducted by the Asian Development Bank Institute show that before the end of 2020, Asians have experienced varying degrees of social mobility since the pandemic struck. Some people who reported having their consumption expenditures decline by a substantial amount during the first survey round already saw increased expenditure during the second round, while others have barely seen improvement. In particular, about 40% of those who reported having financial difficulty in the first round encountered just minor financial difficulty or no financial difficulty in the second round. While one third of those who did not experience financial difficulty in the first round fell in such situation in the second round. In a number of economies like the Philippines and Thailand, the pandemic was more impactful for the poor as shown in the growth rates in income or expenditure before and during pandemic. Here, yellow shaded cells represent instances when growth in a specific income decile is lower than growth of overall mean, while green shaded cells represent the opposite. In 2021, there was some ground for optimism. Almost all economies in the region reported stronger growth rates in 2021 compared to 2020. Some suffered substantial economic loss in 2020, but managed to grow in 2021, undoing economic losses posted a year earlier. 
However, in several economies, the pace of growth in 2021 was not enough to undo the economic loss in 2020. Such diverse variations in economic growth paths point to widening inequality between economies. Nonetheless, using growth forecasts, our simulations show that despite setbacks caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, it is possible to reduce extreme and moderate poverty rate in developing Asia to less than 1% and 7% respectively by 2030. However, there are a number of uncertainties surrounding these projections. First, these are based on a simplifying assumption that all households within an economy experience the same percentage decline in their per capita consumption expenditure and or income as predicted based on GDP per capita growth numbers. As hinted earlier, for some economies where surveys conducted during the pandemic years are available, lower income households experience greater proportional reduction in consumption. Hence, the neutral distribution assumption may underestimate pandemic's impact on poverty rates. Now, if we relax the neutral distribution assumption and consider different degrees of pro poorness of growth, we can see that poverty reduction may be more pronounced if growth is pro poor. By 2030, more than 40% of developing Asia's population may be economically secure, while a quarter may consume at least middle-class expenditure. However, if growth is not pro poor, there might still be almost 2% of the region's population in extreme poverty by the SDG reckoning year in 2030. Even after relaxing the neutral distribution assumption, there are other sources of uncertainty surrounding our projections. For instance, economic growth outlook may be affected by looming threats to food security, energy price shocks, debt burden, geopolitical tensions, and other risk factors. Furthermore, assuming that societies with higher levels of social mobility prior to the pandemic can more easily revert to the virtuous poverty reduction path, the pandemic may have also reshaped the social mobility regime itself, and its impact may manifest at a much later period. For instance, learning losses caused by school closures is an important development topic, yet its full implications on affected children's lifetime earnings and social mobility prospects may not come to light until later, as how it will unfold depends on a number of factors such as effectiveness of remote education and how socioeconomic institutions react to undo the damage to children's learning and well-being. Estimates suggest that developing Asia's students' lifetime earning losses may range between 3.9% of pre-pandemic earnings under a high-efficacy scenario to as much as 8.8% under a low-efficacy scenario, and losses are expected to be much higher among the poor. Within each economy, inequality of opportunities between rich and poor may also further expand due to varying access to complementary remote learning tools, with estimates showing that students from the poorest wealth quintile are expected to have losses in future earnings, which are 47% higher than that of richest students in their economy. On the other hand, the second panel shows that areas with lower scores in social mobility enablers are more likely to experience higher relative lifetime earning losses. Disruptions caused by the pandemic might have also affected people's values and perceptions that could have implication on social mobility prospects. For instance, if we look at the region's labor force participation trends, there are hints that it has not bounced back to pre-pandemic levels. Whether labor force exitors will eventually come back to work or not, may depend on a number of factors, including their perception of distribution of economic opportunities. There are studies showing that long unemployment spells may lead to discouraged job seekers, outdated skill sets, or even adversely affect one's mental health, which in turn may create a vicious cycle of economic inactivity. Regardless of uncertainty surrounding our projections, it is clear that there is a need to accelerate efforts to enhance social mobility prospects, especially for the poor. There are two main factors which contribute to and influence a person's socioeconomic standing, initial socioeconomic status, and institutions. During crises such as a pandemic, 
human capital investments, credit markets, public investments, and even perceptions that may shape one's level of effort may be severely disrupted. While the better off may be able to mitigate these disruptions, the less well off are unable to do so. Hence, structures of a disadvantage may start crystallizing, making it arduous for poor and socioeconomically vulnerable people to exit socioeconomic disadvantage. So it is essential that we mitigate that. One area that we should work on is to ensure that we can sustain a more targeted social protection coverage as developing Asia shifts gear towards recovery and post-pandemic era. Even when pandemic-induced disruption winds down, there are a number of risks such as death, climate change, and political conflict that threaten the region's social mobility prospects. Those who are most vulnerable to such risk will still require access to instruments that can amplify the resilience to these compounding uncertainties. In 2020, while the proportion of poor who receive social assistance cash benefit increased relative to pre-pandemic levels, coverage among the poor remains low. On the other hand, the results from the second wave surveys conducted by ADBI suggest that almost 60% of respondents who did not receive assistance from government during first year of pandemic were not aware of availability of assistance programs. This highlights the need to bring such services closer to those who need them most, but have challenges accessing such type of service. Moving forward, in addition to enhancing social protection systems to amplify resilience, it is also important to improve our performance with respect to other factors that could drive long-term social mobility prospects. For instance, the region's development path since the turn of the millennium chronicles improved transportation networks, enhanced electricity generation capacity, and greater access to telecommunications and water infrastructure. Collectively, such improvements contributed to faster economic growth and poverty reduction prior to the COVID-19 crisis and may help expedite post-pandemic recovery. Despite this progress, disparities in access to key infrastructure and basic services still exist across this region, as noted on this slide. Fostering greater innovation may also play a key role in enhancing social mobility prospects. Furthermore, we should also not lose focus on other important development challenges, such as climate change, if nobody is to be left behind. In the interest of time, I will stop here and I encourage everyone to check out our report, which provides more details. Thank you. Thank you for that, Melissa. So having heard those key findings from the report, we've got a number of expert panelists to provide their perspectives on the report and to respond to questions and comments that you, the audience, may have. So please do type your questions uh, in the chat box. Uh, I can see we've got a couple of them already, which is absolutely great. Um, and we'll get to as many as we can. So let me introduce the panelists to you. To you. Uh, Albert Park, uh, you've met him already. He's the Chief Economist and Director General of ADB's Economic Research and Regional Cooperation Department. Rodora Alde is the Director of the Policy Development and Planning Bureau of the Department of Social Welfare and Development here in the Philippines. Also joining us today is Gaurav Dat. He is Professor and Deputy Director of the Center for Development Economics and Sustainability at Monash University uh, in Australia. And Sonomi Tanaka is the Country Director for ADB's Country Office in Lao PDR. So welcome to all of you, particularly Rodora and Gaurav, welcome to ADB today. It's great to have you with us. Um, I suggest we get to the questions. We have about uh, about 45 minutes. Um, the first question from Dennis uh, asks about some country specific uh, examples. Uh, what has been happening before the pandemic? What happened during the pandemic? And are any specific groups lagging behind in uh, social mobility? Um, I'd like to go to uh, Rodora and Gaurav, uh, sorry, Rodora and uh, uh, and tsunami on that, um, if I may. Uh, Melissa mentioned, of course, um, some uh, some subjective and sort of objective uh, elements of, of poverty, but uh, be good to get specific. Rodora, can I come to you first of all? 
Hi, uh, good morning, everyone. So um, just to answer the question, so in the Philippines, um, prior to the pandemic, uh, we have experienced uh, we have experienced considerable upward uh, social mobility, uh, which we can attribute to our strong economic performance coupled with a pro poor growth strategies such as the implementation of uh, social protection programs such as the CCT, uh, non-contributory um, social pensions, uh, health insurance for the indigent population, among many others. So poverty was on a downward trend from 23.5% in uh, 2015 to 16.7% in 2019, which is about 17.6 million of Filipinos uh, have been identified as poor in uh, 2016. But what happened during the pandemic, um, it reversed the gains of our poverty reduction efforts. The latest poverty incidence is at 18.1% or 19.9 uh, million Filipinos are now poor. So there's an increase of 2 million uh, Filipinos. And um, nonetheless, uh, without the emergency cash assistance program provided by the government, um, the poverty conditions could have been worse. Uh, according to the simulations uh, made by the Philippine Institute of Development Studies, the number of poor Filipinos could be higher if not for the social amelioration program of the government. So uh, other, than the pov other than poverty, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic also increased all forms of, of vulnerability, such as rising unemployment, um, poor and low-income Filipinos who are mostly working in the informal economy have lost their jobs. Our migrant Filipino workers uh, have lost their jobs too. They, they have returned to the Philippines. There's also rising food insecurity and involuntary hunger. And based on the recent World Bank study on the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on low-income households, the Philippines have to address the challenges and barriers to access uh, health and education ser services. Otherwise, there will be an impending human capital crisis. Thanks very much. And just before I go to Sonami, there is somewhat of a related question here from Warren. So, and, and it, it speaks to some of the, uh, the, the, the issues that you just mentioned, Radora. It's a question from Warren who asks, what factors contributed to the pandemic having a greater impact on poor Filipinos uh, from poor compared to poor, poor families uh, in other nations. If I could just ask you that, and then I'll go to Sonami to talk about Lao PDR, if I may. Uh, okay, I think because majority of the Filipinos are, you can find them in the informal sector. So um, they have no job security, no access to uh, uh, insurance, uh, unemployment insurance. I think that contributed to a higher number of Filipinos uh, becoming poorer during the pandemic. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And good to focus on the solutions at this point. Uh, Sonami, can I come to you? I think you've got a lot of experience in, in Lao PDR. You, uh, your thoughts, please. Thank you. Um, and thank you very much for the organizer for inviting me to this, uh, um, this seminar. Um, the social mobility is a, a topic that is very dear to me. Um, as many of you know, I was previously um, a gender equity thematic group uh, chief. And so looking at the gender inequality, dealing with a lot on the social mobility issues. So on, on Laopedia, uh, let me just start with the pre-COVID time. Um, there has been, if you look at back 30 years back, um, so from uh, 1992, um, there were the, the national poverty line, uh, population below national poverty line was 46 uh, percent. And, and within 25 years, it has come, come down to 18.3 percent. So more than half the, the uh, poverty. But uh, when we actually, so that was a quite impressive uh, trend in the past. But if you look at actually the level of poverty, uh, considering that it's a, a lower middle income country using the, the $3.2 per day poverty line, and there's a 34% of the population still below poverty line. And that's uh, quite high considering that the same level of the, the economies around. And, you know, um, looking around there are multi le levels of uh, poverty in terms of malnutrition and stunting is quite prevalent in this country. In terms of the education level, 
Um, and in particular, the quality of learning has been quite low when you can compare with the other um, neighboring countries. And the nature of employment has been agriculture and, and uh, more on the family subsistence, subsistence level. In terms of the population that is lagging behind is uh, definitely the uh, upland the ethnic groups um, and women among them particularly. And, and so that's all re very much consistent with the findings uh, in the, the 2020 World Economic Forum's Global Social Mobility Report that uh, Melissa was also referring to. Unfortunately, Lao PDL was ranked 72 out of the 82 countries. And that's and, and when the other Southeast Asian countries have a, a better ranking, um, I think that uh, Lao PDR has not been performing well. And in particular, access to education, technology, and social protection. Um, and now looking at post-COVID, I mean, definitely the situation has uh, gone worse, but we don't really have a very comprehensive data to show that we don't have the um, poverty uh, level at the moment, but uh, more um, area specific uh, surveys such as the World Bank's um, telephone surveys, 42% uh, of the children have reportedly uh, stopped attending classes during the, the COVID. So learning loss is huge um, due to the large public debt uh, situation. Uh, there isn't the fiscal space for social protection is very limited. So during the COVID time, there has not been a major support from the government of social protection. So uh, definitely showing the uh, sign that the social upward social mobility opportunities um, um, lacking and, and, and performance is going down uh, after the COVID. Recovery is still to be seen, but again, they're going back to the debt situation and tight fiscal that is really uh, creating a, a huge uh, issue. I'll stop here. Thanks very much. Thanks. Um, we've got a couple of questions in here on education. So I'd like to go to uh, Albert and, and Gaurav, um, if I may. Um, Albert, first of all, there's a question here about uh, asking how we recover from learning losses. Uh, Melissa mentioned uh, this, of course, uh, in her presentation and uh, uh, learning losses, you know, critical, of course, to future earnings and future social mobility. Could I get some comments on you? And then I'll go to Gaurav to ask about the next question on leapfrogging. Sure, well, learning loss is a huge challenge right now, uh, not just in Laos, uh, but in many countries and regions, also in the Philippines, where kids are just coming back to face-to-face -to -face schooling after a long separation. And the concerning thing about the learning loss, you know, with respect to the topic of today's discussion on social mobility, is that it's very well documented now, both in Western countries, but even more in developing countries, that it was the poorest kids, the kids without access to um, uh, the internet who uh, lost the most learning <laughs> during the pandemic. So the inequality gaps in learning widened. And so that creates a lot of challenges. We recently, um, a group of researchers in the ADB who've been focusing on this learning loss issue recently uh, released a policy brief, which really outlines things that countries, measures that countries can take to address the learning loss uh, challenge. Uh, the first, of course, is to get kids back in school. I think all of the data suggests that the benefits in terms of education, uh, quality and learning far outweighs any of the health risks if it's done in a smart way. Um, second, once the kids are back in school, it's really important to test them and figure out what the degree of learning loss is and understand the differences across uh, students. And then third, um, it's important to uh, implement uh, learning uh, teaching approaches that can teach at the student's level. Uh, so um, that can be done in different ways, either by having more teaching assistants to teach uh, different students at different levels, to have uh, volunteer tutors to help with the support for uh, the lagging students, using education technology where students can kind of learn at their own pace, um, or uh, trying to uh, group students, even in the same class into, or even across multiple grades into similar classes if they're at the same learning level. Another thing that's really important is to help kids catch up to where they should have been uh, 
um, is to prioritize uh, teaching of foundational skills. You have to make some choices. You might have to increase instructional instructional time to help them to catch up as well. And all of this requires a lot of strong support for teachers to understand uh, how to effectively address this challenge. Um, I recently visited India and met the education permanent secretary of one of the states uh, in Madhya, Madhya Pradesh state. And she said one of the real unexpected um, products of the COVID pandemic was that uh, the local educational uh, system developed a very good online uh, teacher training uh, program where teachers were uh, getting access to short videos, giving them uh, suggestions on how to teach online, how to do very, they're very practical, very useful, and very popular. And so this uh, using uh, online methods to support uh, teacher uh, training turned out to be one of the lasting benefits of the pandemic. So maybe I'll stop there and turn it back to Karen. Thanks. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks so much. And you know, as you rightly said, we're getting, as you rightly said, I mean, uh, oh, sorry, I was wondering Karen, if I could please, just please. add uh, a follow up on what, uh, uh, what Albert just said on the uh, learning loss challenge and how to, uh, you know, what one can do about it. I mean, I think, you know, as, as, uh, so I completely agree with all the things that uh, Albert mentioned. I think we kind of have a reasonably good idea in terms of what needs to be done and uh, whether, you know, it's the so-called rapid framework, which effectively what, uh, uh, you know, uh, Albert summarized as well. Uh, I think the challenge is going to be to be able to do it uh, at scale. And that's uh, going to be a, a massive challenge because I think there is certainly a lot of experimental evidence as well that these uh, remedial teaching methods uh, linked to an assessment of learning level and focusing on foundational skills and so on, they, they do work. But uh, given the size of the COVID uh, challenge, you know, where, you know, the estimates of uh, learning poverty are, are as much as 70%, up from about 55 percent uh, pre-pandemic so doing this on scale and doing it quickly is going to be a big challenge and uh, and there is this challenge of you know what uh, john list describes as the velocity challenge when you scale up programs often the velocity or the effectiveness of the program goes down and uh, so that's going to be a real challenge and it really does call for a, a, a very solid commitment on the part of uh, government agencies in particular to 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 invest in this as uh, it's not business as usual we need to do something extra so i think whatever the international agencies can also do to uh, to 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 kind of mobilize that level of commitment and investment uh, that would be very important sorry no no problem have you seen anywhere where that has been done successfully at scale gara um I, I can't be sure. I mean, I think um, because this is all very recent, um, so I'm not sure whether this I have any ready-made examples of where it's being done uh, uh, at scale yet. I mean, in India, there is there are some successful examples. You know, one uh, briefly Albert mentioned, but also in this state of Delhi, they have been quite proactive in this space uh, with a huge commitment of resources to education. And, uh, and uh, again, I, this is all anecdotal, uh, but I think uh, they, they have been held up as an example of, you know, the system really bouncing back uh, in terms of dealing with this learning loss challenge. Right, right. Um, can I stick with you, though, Gaurav, um, to, to come to a, you know, a question we've got here in the chat box um, about catching up? Um, there's a question here about leapfrogging. Is there any leapfrogging or innovations that, that can be done? I think by leapfrogging, what uh, we're really talking about here is the typical approach of uh, improving access to edu education, then uh, teaching the basic skills, and then teaching the uh, you know higher order thinking and skills. Is there a way to get more quickly through those steps, or do we have to go through those steps one by one? So, you know, my sense is that uh, I think we, 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 we are probably, we should be beyond this uh, approach of, uh, you know, quantity of education first followed by quality later. I think um, if you look at the past several decades, I, I think quite a lot of progress has been made in terms of access and just uh, 
you know, the quantity of education, if you like, you know, uh, and what is has emerged over the same period as an, uh, you know, increasingly important challenge is the, this issue of learning. Getting children to school is one thing, but making sure their learning is uh, is another. And there, actually, the, the evidence clearly points to, uh, you know, fairly uh, a stagnant uh, story of stagnation in terms of learning deficits, uh, which are quite persistent, and uh, of course exacerbated uh, hugely by 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 the COVID uh, lockdown and and school closures. So I think we we can't, in my view, we can't afford to. Uh, uh, you know, uh, take a sequential approach. I think we have to put, you know, uh, quality and learning, uh, addressing learning deficits as front and center uh, going forward. And um, going back to what we were talking earlier, so in some ways, um, even uh, compromise in the quality of education is also affecting, uh, you know, uh, parental commitment to education at higher levels of education as well. So, um, so in in some sense, the leapfrogging that's involved is, uh, is 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 really in the quality space that we need to make it front and center. Um, so maybe I'll stop here. Right, quality quality over quantity. Uh, we hear that very often, don't we? Of course. Um, I'd like to come back to uh, Sonomi and Rodora because there is a question here about lagging areas. How do we improve social mobility in those lagging areas? Of course, uh, that might include, uh, that, that might have the cost of a brain drain if we encourage people to move, but uh, it's suggesting that uh, having policies targeted at remote or rural areas can be very costly. Um, Sonomi, can I come to you first and then uh, Rodora very quickly? Perhaps sure. in your local context. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so in the case of Lao PDR, um, as I said earlier, the, the lagging behind areas, particularly upland uh, remote areas, the government has been uh, um, implementing a conscious uh, policy to sort of um, give them incentive to come down uh, more lower land with uh, better infrastructure and access to services on the uh, lowland areas. Um, that to, and, and also to, in a way, that would support them and transform their agriculture-based economy to, to more job-based economy. Uh, there has been, and, and in, in that sense, there will be more uh, education and in skills and in an uh, upward social mobility. The, this strategy, I mean, following also the Vietnam model, has been, there has been some success in terms of a, you know, better access to service, public services, but uh, uh, in some areas, there are reports that um, transforming into a different type of agricultural economy it has not been very easy for some of the ethnic groups. Um, so, you know, um, another way, uh, of course, will be to the out-migration. Uh, and so that's more of a voluntary out-migration. And it's not necessarily that the local government is, is pushing, but uh, the out migration, particularly to the neighboring Thailand, has been quite the popular. And once again, this is a quite informal uh, migration from Laupedia is quite informal. So we don't have a very reliable data, but uh, it's estimated about 15% of the households in the Laupedia uh, received the migrant workers' remittances. So that's quite substantial. The, the issue is um, the, the type of uh, migration has not been bringing in sufficient enough uh, remittances because of its informal nature. Uh, and also the system of how to uh, best utilize, unlike the Philippines, to into a more uh, systematized way, into a more productive use has not been, um, it's kind of lagging behind in terms of the government's approach. So given all this, again, yes, that the changing of the you know, location and a more mobility um, within the country and also across the countries, it is happening. But uh, when we look at the country like the Philippines, I was living there for the last 22 years, and seeing a lot of changes happen, I'm looking forward to also hearing from Rodora of the experience, but the nothing of that nature of the migrant workers bringing back 
to the country. And the COVID uh, impact is very huge that uh, we see that a lot of people who used to work in Thailand are unable to go back there because also there's a job, uh, um, demands are, are quite limited uh, still in Thailand. Thanks, thanks, Sonomi. Uh, Rodora, anything to add on that? Anything uh, Philippine specific? Um, yeah, for the uh, lagging behind areas, uh, we have in the Philippines, we call geographically isolated and disadvantaged areas. So we are very, uh, we have already identified those areas and have factored them in, in deciding our programs and interventions, including how do we deliver to these areas. So um, actually, when we do um, cash transfers, uh, the factors, the the, the Overhead costs that comes with it have been considered. So how do we reach more people in these areas have always been the priority. Second, we have a community development approach for uh, provinces uh, that have higher poverty incidence, which builds the capacities of the communities, including our um, uh, local chief executives um, in um, empowering the people and in uh, through the, uh, through uh, uh, identifying and uh, identifying what are the uh, problems that can be uh, that can, uh, what are the problems that can be identified that can be resolved by the community and the, um, together of course with the government and uh, in also providing a basic social infrastructure. Thanks very much, Rodora. Um, I know we're bouncing around a little bit on questions, but there are so many issues tied up uh, in this post-pandemic recovery social mobility uh, issue, of course. Um, I'd like to, um, to target a question now to Albert, you know, back to this uh, schooling issue. Uh, and you mentioned that schools are just reopening uh, in the Philippines. Uh, the question is, will a, will a delayed return to face-to-face -face classes, such as the one experienced in the Philippines, contribute to greater future earnings losses? Or does ADB believe that online learning has improved to a point where that's no longer a problem? Um. It's a problem. I don't think uh, the online learning uh, in most countries can be as effective as face-to-face. Uh, -face. And also a lot of kids who are not in school just don't have access to online learning. They don't have uh, internet access or they don't have a signal or they don't have a mobile phone or a computer or a, a laptop uh, to access it. So uh, it's very unequal in terms of access. The only country that seem to have done pretty well substituting online learning for face-to-face -face was Korea, which is very technologically connected <laughs> in terms of the internet infrastructure. And also the school closures were not that long, um, where it didn't seem like academic performance was heavily affected on average, but still the inequality in, there's some research that suggests the inequality in learning still increased during the pandemic, even in that context. But in other, uh, Places, especially the Philippines, I think we expect that, yes, the delay in return is going to have a, unless there's these very uh, aggressive efforts to address the problem with urgency, as Gaurav described, and, and aggressiveness and with resource commitments, then um, I think any delay, the delay thus far, any future delay will certainly affect labor productivity going forward. Thanks very much. Yeah, um, so great to see that, pe that kids are returning to school here in the Philippines. Um, I, there's uh, some questions here about uh, conditional cash transfers and social mobility. I'd like to come to Gaurav, um, if, if I may. Uh, the question is pretty simple. Uh, which one is more impactful uh, for social mobility, social assistance programs or social security programs, uh, particularly in the post-COVID context? Any views? I think the question is simple. The answer may not be quite as simple. Um, so, you know, traditionally, I mean, you know, there's this uh, uh, distinction made between social assistance programs and, and social security or social insurance programs. In practice, you know, the programs that we have actually have both these, often have both these functions, you know, I mean, the cash transfer program at one level is an assistance program, but it also provides an insurance function uh, for uh, people who don't have, uh, you know, either savings or other means of self-insurance. So in some ways, in terms of the content of the programs, uh, the distinction is, is much more blurred. And um, 
in terms of addressing uh, social mobility, uh, it seems to me that you know while there's there's a there's a role for both these types of interventions, but also beyond that as well. I mean, a, I mean a closely related idea to social mobility is the idea of promoting equality of opportunity. And uh, so, you know, for instance, we've talking, we talk quite a bit about education. So, you know, a, a series of measures to equalize the quality of opportunity in education, both in the quantity terms and qual the quality terms is going to be critical. Uh, promoting uh, child health uh, through, you know, uh, various interventions so that, you know, we, we, we don't have the levels of, you know, child malnutrition that we do observe in many of the countries in this region. That's important and important eventually for social mobility. Um, I would also put in there digital and financial literacy is, is increasingly important in our modern world. And again, providing equal opportunities for, for that is, is going to be important as part of the education package, if you like. And uh, Finally, I think we need to tackle uh, the growing inequality of income and wealth, which was happening even prior to the pandemic and uh, has uh, only worsened uh, since the pandemic or during the pandemic. And there, again, there's a, be a whole slew of things that one needs to really think about in terms of, you know, uh, uh, taxation of wealth and, uh, and inheritance tax, et cetera. Um, would be part of that uh, set of measures that one would uh, want to think about in terms of uh, promoting future uh, social mobility. Um, and finally, you know, people uh, talk about, um, you know, the pattern of growth itself. Uh, I think the priority at the moment post-COVID is just to resume growth because it's been a bit uneven across countries in the region. So the first order priority is actually just to uh, a resumption of the growth process, but uh, but a longer standing concern, which has also witnessed in the increasing income inequality in not only in, in our region, but in many other parts of the world is, is the pattern of growth, which has led to growing within country inequalities. So, so, you know, more longer term kind of measures so that we, we have a more inclusive pattern of growth is going to be important. So actually there's a I mean, these social mobility, inequality, poverty, in the end, they're all uh, the, the kind of programs we want to think about are, are closely related, actually, in some ways. Uh, the, many of the things we think in terms of addressing poverty, either income poverty, multidimensional poverty or inequality, uh, ultimately also have a role in uh, promoting social mobility. Also, the evidence, you know, the Great Gatsby Curve evidence, for instance, which suggests that uh, countries which have lower levels of inequality have higher levels of social mobility also points to the need to address things like income inequality and wealth inequality. So let me stop here. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, I think you're talking really about an ecosystem um, of, uh, of approaches, right? But I think that gets to the core of the next question that I'm seeing coming in. This is about um, unconditional cash transfers. Um, and, and the question is, um, what are the benefits or otherwise of unconditional cash transfers, given that they don't have this long lasting impact? Uh, you know, you mentioned that being, you know, critical here. And maybe I'll throw that uh, open even to Melissa, since I do know this was addressed in, um, in the key indicators as well. Um, Rodora, Gaurav, Melissa, any comments? There were a lot of researchers and experts doing poverty research and the cause is really significant. And then this joke comes around that many poverty researchers have been rich because of this. So this question also comes, comes to mind. Why not just dis distribute this money to the poor? But now that we have this cash assistance program, it makes me also think that in the long run, this is not good and affects the values of people, how they value th this money and their, their social economic status. I think this is something that we should, uh, uh, I mean, uh, make further research after this uh, cash assistance program. Yeah, thank you. That's thanks. my thought. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, uh, Melissa. Um, Rodora, could I come to you potentially on this uh, unconditional cash transfer issue, but also uh, on the question here, which is asking whether there are any other interventions uh, that the Philippines uh, 
could have uh, could have adopted uh, in order to uh, sort of in improve uh, the status quo currently. Okay, um, it's a difficult question, I may say. Um, well, I think uh, sure. what comes what comes to my mind um, was it, we could have uh, provided support services to all our economic and health frontliners meaning their access to transportation and to mobility during the pandemic was very limited. It was hard for them to go to, go to their jobs. Um, and then for our frontliners, we, we have limited access to free testing. So it could really, it could have helped us in many ways to become more, I think uh, it, it was difficult. It, we are not very, um, of course, uh, comfortable going out without uh, knowing that we might be, we might contract a virus, so it could have helped us. Uh, the support services to our workers, uh, if if we, it was available, then it could have been much easier, and uh, we could have uh, lessened the impact of the pandemic. Yes, retrospection is a, is a wonderful thing, isn't it? <laughs> isn't it? Uh, thanks, Rodora, for that that perspective. Um, there's another question here about uh, the the gender um, impacts, and I'd like to come to Sonomi. Could I uh, could I ask you to address this? Yeah. So I hope you uh, repeat the question. Thanks. Yeah. So um, I'll talk about you know the the general uh, gender impact um, of COVID. And plus, because I'm saying plus because of the after the uh, Russian invasion in Ukraine, there's also been a lot of economic impact of inflation and all that. Uh, but but then I also wanted to to talk about you know what are the kind of a successful policies. Uh, just moving on to a more you know looking ahead. So uh, on low PDR, like in in other countries, um, the very comprehensive, once again, the comprehensive data and the surveys are limited. But uh, again, from what we are learning is number one, the increased uh, unpaid care and domestic work burden uh, coming back to, to women uh, under the lockdown situation. Number two, uh, education. Again, I think the girls are really dropping out of the girl, uh, girls drop out, drop out rate higher in, in many of the countries. Number three, gender-based violence in the confine, uh, and 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 also um, reduce access to more regular maternal uh, health, and in particular for pregnant women um, and the, the old um, reproductive uh, uh, health uh, service access as well. Uh, all these things combined, women have been uh, really uh, going through a very difficult time, but. Um, and certainly that has affected the, the uh, women's and girls' social mobility in, in the life cycle. Now, uh, when we look at the, the past experience, how what are the parameters that have been successful in the policy um, areas in, in narrowing gender inequalities and in having intergenerational impact? Uh, certainly looking at the gender inequality itself is a very important parameter for, for social mobility, not just for women uh, versus men, boys versus girls, but also looking at the society as a whole, um, particularly when we look at the intergenerational impact. And then the famous, uh, of course, research is about uh, uh, the more educated women having a better uh, for, for the children of the better educated women will have much better health uh, outcomes and learning outcomes, as well as the income generation opportunities. So uh, it's it's a it's a trigger um, when we look at the overall SDGs and how we can address these issues, and in particular looking at the social mobility. But I, I tell you that I think that you know there has been a lot of discussion about the. Uh, resource transfers, cash transfers, um, in what way, whether it's conditional or unconditional is, it, is you know, it really depends and then there's more research needed, but certainly some kind of a resource, resource transfer uh, will be helpful, but particularly looking at um, policy and institution reforms, for example, legal reforms in terms of the inheritance of the land, so that a girl born in a, a low-income country will not be um, disadvantaged in terms of the lifetime 
in terms of the access to uh, economic opportunities as well as the income generation opportunities because you know land is a collateral and the ownership of, of the resources and assets would be really crucial. But this is a very difficult area in terms of reforms, but we have to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And this is why we're here, of course, and this is why we're having this very, very important um, discussion. We're, we're coming up to the, uh, the, the bottom of the hour, which is unfortunately the end of our discussion, but I want to get to the real crux of the discussion here and just ask you if you, if you could respond very, very briefly, um, everybody. Uh, the question is about what policies should we now be adopting uh, to address poverty and socio socioeconomic inequalities and what we have we learned. If I could come to Garov first, Rodora, Sonomi, and then Albert to wrap up, please, but very, very briefly. So, I mean, uh, I will actually just mention two things which uh, I think in the current context uh, seem to be very high priority at the moment. One is, uh, both things have been mentioned earlier, but uh, one is uh, resumption of the growth process, which has been um, kind of uh, thrown off, off kilter uh, by COVID. And, uh, and of course, uh, some countries are doing better than others, but uh, important to get that going. And to the extent uh, uh, public investment, et cetera, uh, can help that process. So that's a, a very high priority in terms of even poverty reduction going forward. And second, actually, the issue of this learning loss that we've talked about, it, it, to me, it seems the time to act on it is now uh, and, and, and in a big and important way. So I think if we can get these two things done in the next two, three years, that would be a tremendous achievement. Fantastic. Growth and education. Thank you. Uh, Rodora. Um, maybe I'll just a quick response. I think um, we have to first identify and remove the barriers and maybe the interventions to remove the barriers. Uh, in the practical terms is um, we have to lower the cost of accessing the services and make it available for everyone, especially those who are at the uh, who are really the ultra poor. Second, I think what we have learned from the Philippines is to improve our targeting system, but our targeting system is be, is mostly based on income and not on risks and vulnerability. Vulnerability. So we have to consider that in the development of our interventions. Perfect. Uh, Sonomi, you mentioned a number of things related to with relation to women. Anything more? Um, I will add uh, data. Um, you know, uh, we started in, in Lao PDR the collection uh, TA technical assistance that supports the disaggregated data by 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 sex, by uh, the areas, by poverty status, uh, sorry income status, and and also disability and the ethnic group. Um, it, it's very crucial, and investment in, in data is very important. I mean, of course, I, I agree with all of it, the growth in education, certainly, and the be, be, uh, better targeting and reducing the service cost. Yeah, absolutely. The disaggregated data, you know, helps Rodora do what she was talking about, which is the better targeting, of course. Uh, Albert, any, any parting words or comments or thoughts? Um, a quick word on conditional versus unconditional uh, transfers. I think the research is very mixed on the relative benefits of, of the two types. Uh, conditions obviously are going to improve outcomes on what you condition it on, if that's what you care about. But in some sense, they're paternalistic. If you really trust households to use the money in the best way that's going to help them most, then unconditional is obviously going to be better. And for some general outcomes, it's preferred. But I think it really depends on what the policy goals are. Um, in terms of other policies, I think Goroff laid out a pretty good taxonomy earlier on the different elements of promoting uh, social mobility. There's obviously short-term targeting, which is just stuff, but then there's longer term. One thing that, um, you know, we've done a couple of uh, evaluations of uh, a multi-dimensional kind of intervention to help the poor, especially the persistently poor, recognizing that the barriers to real mo upper mobility often are multi-dimensional. It's not just one thing, it's many things. And so there's a, a, a approach called the graduation approach, which is becoming more uh, popular, which includes a series of interventions, including some asset transfers, some cash transfers, some technical training, some home visits, 
and uh, some access to savings accounts, et cetera, because it recognizes that unless you have a whole set of um, conditions, it's hard to really uh, address the poverty issue in, in a kind of in a persistent way, in a way that's going to really uh, uh, be to be effective over the longer term. And of course, that's kind of expensive, but uh, may be important. So thinking about some of the long term challenges of chronic poverty. Thank you. Thanks so much, Albert. Well, as we mentioned, you know, not an easy subject, but, you know, something which is absolutely critical for us to address. And as Gaurav said earlier, to address at scale. So I I'm afraid we're at the end of the webinar now. I'd like to thank everybody for their active participation. We saw some excellent questions and I apologize for those we were unable to get to. Our next Asian Impact webinar is on the 15th of September on the topic of sustainable bond issuance, where we'll be getting some practical insights of how to make such bonds work in Southeast Asia. So please do join us then too. Until then, I'd very much like to thank our external experts and guests, Radora Alde, Gaurav Dat, and from ADB, Sonomi Tanaka, our presenter, Melissa Pasqua, and our host and ADB chief economist, Albert Park. Thank you so much for joining us, and I wish you a wonderful rest of the day. <laughs>